All right, today we are working through the full body split. Now, this is a split that I typically like to program for clients that are relatively newer to strength training. That said, this split can also work for clients that do have a bit more experience, but just don't have that much time to train. So I've also seen this split work very effectively for like clients that have been training for years, have kind of been spinning their wheels, but they've typically been following more of like a cardio or boot camp style training or even more of a CrossFit style of training, but they haven't really been training that effectively when it comes to building muscle or building strength. So this can be a very effective split for a multitude of clients. That said, it generally works best for clients that want to um, pack on, or excuse me, to lose fat, not to pack on muscle. Because if we are working with clients that want, the problem here is not necessarily a problem, it very much depends on the context of your client. But one of the main limiting factors here when we have this three times a week full body split is our ability to accrue volume. We're only training three times a week, so we just can't rack up that much volume, which does eventually become the limiting factor here when it comes to building more muscle. That said, for clients who want to get leaner, build a great physique, and again, many clients within their first couple years of proper training can make great progress on the split. This is probably the split I program the second most after um, the four times a week upper lower split, which is why I went through that first in this program design mastery course. But I use this a lot. Now, again, one last time, it's typically geared towards clients that are chasing fat loss and they just want to feel functionally strong, more athletic, more well conditioned overall, basically just live in a lean, strong body, look great, but also feel capable of moving well. So here, as opposed to more of a traditional bodybuilding style of programming, we do focus a lot more on kind of this functional bodybuilding slash strength style of training where we really get the best of both worlds. So how I like to typically start this off, of course, we start each training day with a primer. Now, this, I've talked about this in depth in the last program design vlog that I did. But basically, we want to make sure if we're training lower body, we're doing something to activate the glutes or the hamstrings if we're doing um, a deadlift variation to start our training day. And our primer is really dependent on what our first metric based lift is of the day. If our first metric based lift of the day is going to be a deadlift, then I'd like something that's kind of a combo of glutes and hamstrings. So let's say like a straight leg hip bridge. If it's going to be a squat, I like to very much focus on knee flexion because your hamstrings are very essential to help stabilize in the knees. So something like a Swiss ball leg curl. Um, even if in this case of our first metric based movement is an upper body movement, we still want to do something to prime the lower body as well, activate those posterior muscles because they are still important to these because we're still, we are training full body. So we are still going to be move, using some movements that are going to require glutes, hamstrings to work as stabilizers, and they're going to be working as the primary movers as well. So it's still important to activate those. So we're going to do something for the lower body, typically some type of hip bridge, straight leg hip bridge, or leg curl variation. We want to do something for the upper back. So if we're starting with some type of horizontal press, we'll typically do some type of band pull apart. That's going to activate the upper backs, or, or, or uh, excuse me, some type of band pull apart, some type of band face pull, or cable face pull, something like that, that's going to activate the upper back, which is essential to stabilizing your shoulders as you press. If we're going to start with a deadlift, then we would more likely want to do something to activate the lats, like a straight arm band pull down, a cable pull down, because our lats are going to play a key role in our ability to deadlift. And then finally, it's always smart here to do some type of anti-movement exercise, especially though if we are a little bit heavier on lower body. So if we're doing a squat variation, um, a heavy deadlift variation. We for sure want to basically prime our body to prime our core specifically to better be able to brace and resist movement when we go into that heavy movement. And then finally, we can do some type of explosive movement that's mimic mimicking the first pattern we're going to be training of the day, that first heavy metric based movement. So 
tip, for example, if we were doing a deadlift, we could start with a broad jump. And this is just gonna prime your nervous system to be more explosive with that movement pattern. Here we'd keep this relatively low reps, about three to five reps, like we see here. And we're just trying to prime our nervous system. Um, if we're doing a bench press, then we could do like a pilot push-up, uh, bent over chest throw, squat, we could do a box squat, a jump squat, something like that. <clears throat> so as far as the primer goes, that's typically how we lay this out. And again, I know I went super in depth in this in the last program design masterclass. So go check that out if you want more info on this. So from here, we're getting into the programming specifically for full body three times a week. So every training day starts with what we call the metric based movement. Here we're really pushing strength in typically the five to 10 rep range. And if, if it's deadlifts, I like to bring that down to about, I like to think four to seven or four to eight at the most rep range, just because the reality is a traditional deadlift or most of our deadlift variations when it comes to like a sumo deadlift, an elevated deadlift, a conventional deadlift. None of them are that great of movements for hypertrophy. But if we're training them in the hypertrophy ranges, we're not really getting that great of strength outcomes out of them either. So we'd be better served just swap in like a Romanian deadlift. So in this case, I like to keep, when it comes to deadlifts, I like to keep rep ranges a little bit lower. But then across our three training days, so again, we have three full body training days here. We wanna alternate which variation of these metric based movement patterns we have. So how I like to lay this out, day one, we're starting with some type of deadlift variation or some type of hinge variation. So again, that could be a trap bar deadlift, which most clients will feel very good with, an elevated deadlift, another one that clients will typically feel pretty good with, a conventional deadlift or a sumo deadlift. Now those two are typically, many clients that we work with have trouble bracing properly, will have some type of type back issues or just won't give a shit about trying to build up their conventional or sumo deadlift. So it makes more sense to program in like a trap bar variation, an elevated variation. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of the trap bar personally. That's the, when we're talking deadlifts from the floor, that's probably the variation that I program the most. Day two, we have a horizontal press. So here we're talking something like here we're talking something like um, a dumbbell flat bench press, a floor press, a low incline press, a barbell bench press, whatever you know your client feels good with. And again, our goal here is to progress this weekly by adding either reps or weight across the course of the mesocycle, if at all possible. And then finally, day three, we have some type of squat pattern. So what we've done here is basically we know with day one's deadlift, there's going to be a lot of stress on the lower back regardless. So day two, we are taking some time to basically relieve that stress and let your body recover, let your client's body recover, I should say. And then day three, we're getting back under the heavy barbell where there is a lot more axial loading. But we're spacing this out smartly. Um, from there, so basically we're always going to start our day or we're going to start each day with one heavy metric based movement. Again, I like to start with day one, some type of heavy hinge variation, day two, some type of heavy press variation, and day three, some type of squat variation. Now, realize that this isn't set in stone. So if you have a client who really wants to focus on building up their barbell overhead press, then the start of day two would be a good place to sub in that barbell overhead press as opposed to just making this a horizontal press. Because we also really wanna focus on movements that our clients enjoy training, enjoy seeing improvement with. Because these metric-based movements ex especially, that's where we're gonna see the biggest jumps week to week and month to month. Similarly with the squat pattern here, like we can plug in a box squat, a back squat, a hack squat, a landmine squat, or a front squat. But it doesn't even have to be a barbell squat or quote unquote back squat, which I know the hack squat doesn't necessarily apply or front squat, I sh should say, doesn't necessarily apply there. This could literally just be a Bulgarian split squat, but we want some type of knee dominant pattern. And that's the, that's the theme across all of these training days. 
as you can see here, or you can hear if you're listening to this in the podcast version, basically I have it laid out. Every training day, we're gonna hit some type of hinge or hip dominant movement, lower body hinge, hip dominant movement, or we could say posterior dominant movement, some type of knee dominant movement or a squat or lunge pattern, an upper body push and an upper body pull. So the reality is, as long as we train those patterns, across the course of a training day, then your clients have essentially hit all the major muscle groups in their body. So here across the course of the training week, you'll see, or you'll hear again if you listen to the podcast here, that our main priority is just making sure that we hit knee, hip, push, pull across the course of a training day. So walking through day one, or the sample day one that I have laid out, we're starting off with a deadlift variation. Next, we're going to go into an upper lower superset. And anytime we're programming, like um, anytime we're programming for full body, again, I like to start out with a metric based movement. This is followed by an upper lower superset. And we want to make sure that this first upper lower superset is alternating upper body push, lower body pull, or lower body push, upper body pull. So, or we could think hip push or pull knee, right? So the thinking here is we want to make sure that we are not doing one movement that's going to take away from the next within the supersets. So typically if we're training our push muscles on our lower body, to a certain extent, the push muscles on our upper body might be involved. Whereas the pull muscles on our upper body would be involved to a lesser extent. Same thing goes for upper body pushes, but to a lesser degree. Um, so it's smart to alternate push, pull, upper, lower within the superset. Now there are also something that I touched on there. Typically our upper body movements aren't going to have as much overall fatigue or create as much overall fatigue as our lower body movements. So for example, even if we're doing like a heavy set of Bulgarian split squats, my arms are still going to get somewhat, my upper body is still going to get somewhat fatigued there, like the weight on my back, my arms, it's almost like, depending on how long your set of split squats is going, it's almost like doing um, a heavy set of armor carries as well. So we know if I go right into an upper body pull after that, that's really going to detract from it. So whereas if we flip this around, we start with the upper body movement. So let's say we do a chest supported row first. And then we go into like a Bulgarian split squat. Well, we will have some fatigue in the upper back. We haven't fatigued the lower body at all. So typically we'll be able to perform better on most movements if we lay it out in this fashion. So again, we're typically starting the day with a metric based movement. That's gonna be followed by an upper lower superset. So this will take us through three of our four boxes. So again, oh, and also one more thing I should mention on this, these first three movements. So let's say day one, we start with a heavy hinge variation. So we've hit our hip, we've hit this hip variation. So we know that our next, within our next superset, we wanna do something that's gonna to touch on the knee variation, a box that we wanna check off. So if we started with deadlift, then we could go into, okay, I'm going to do, I wanna do some type of knee dominant movement within this next superset. So let's say that's a dumbbell walking lunge. And then I know since that's knee dominant, I need to do something for the other side of my upper body. So some type of pull movement. So let's say dumbbell row. So we have a deadlift variation, a dumbbell row, and then we're going into a dumbbell walking lunge. Now from there, I like to set this up. Then we have another superset. Now this second superset can either be something lower, or not necessarily lower body, excuse me. The second superset will start with whichever movement we haven't taken off this box so far. So remember, we, or whichever box we haven't taken off so far. So remember, we have knee, hip, push, pull. So whichever those we haven't taken off so far. So in the case of this sample day we've been talking about so far, we have already hit hip with our deadlift variation. We've already hit pull with our row variation. We've already hit knee with our walking lunge. So we need some type of upper body push. And this can be supersetted with some type of movement that 
either strengthens or strengthens, excuse me, our client's weak points. So t- for most clients, most gin pop clients, it's going to be they need more volume for their glutes, hamstrings, or upper back. Typically, low back issues, shoulder issues, knee issues are the struggles that most people have. And it's not a coincidence that glutes, hamstrings, and upper back are most people's weaknesses. So the second movement of this superset is a smart place to add that in. Now, or we can if or we can implement some type of anti-movement um, exercise here. So if the client needs more core stability work, this is also a good place to sub that in. So here, for example, again, taking it back to our sample day, I keep walking through this. We're going to have a deadlift variation going right into a superset of dumbbell rows and dumbbell walking lunges. And then here we're going to go into an EMOM. So we're going to set a nine minute timer. And at the top of every minute, clients are going to alternate between first minute one barbell hip thrust for eight to 10 reps. Minute two, they're going to do um, six to eight reps of a half kneeling shoulder press with the right arm. Minute three, they're going to do six to eight reps of a half kneeling shoulder press with the left arm. And they're going to pee that for nine total minutes, just starting at the top of every minute. So, well, this first round will take three minutes. So they'll hit three rounds of each exercise here. Now that's similar to a superset. I know it's had a superset, but very similar. I like to work in things like EMOMs, AMRAPs, et cetera, because it does give the clients a much more like, okay, this is a functional style of training we're doing. This is fun, it's new and exciting, but we're still hitting these rules we need for very effective programming. So here again, we checked off with this happening in the shoulder press. We checked off that final box we needed, which was an upper body push. And then we added more volume to a typical weak point with a barbell hip thrust, which is going to train the client's glutes hamstrings. Now, it's also important to realize here, okay, we already did a deadlift, which again puts a lot of stress on the client's back. We want to make sure that if we are adding in more hip dominant movements here, that they're not ones that are going to add a lot more stress to the client's back because that's where injuries happen. Um, clients get smashed, burn out, et cetera. So a hip thrust variation is a great option here because we don't load the spine too terribly much. And then finally, we go into our finisher. So here, the finishers are very much going to be an adherence tool for clients. This is where we give the client some of what they want as well as work on a bit more of what they need. So for fat loss clients, I really like circuits that implement some core stability work, um, add more upper body volume, and we're also pushing their aerobic system a little bit. And then for clients that want to focus more on muscle building, honestly, I don't typically program a full body split for clients that just wanna build as much muscle as possible. But if we have a client who wants to get leaner, but say he also mentioned like, Yo, I really love training my biceps. It's gonna be really motivated to see, like, to get a good bicep pump. It's just super fun for me. Then this is where we'd program into biceps. So he's already hit these smart basics that we know he needs, as opposed to if we just programmed him a whole arm day. But this finisher here is where we really get more buy-in from the client and give them more of what they need at the same time. So here, for example, I have to end this training day, I have a five minute AMRAP where the client is going to set a five minute timer and work to complete as many rounds as possible, but maintain quality form. So here we have banded Y raises for 15 to 20 reps, really going to work the upper backs, upper back, rear delts, a band leg curl for 10 to 15 reps. So they can move from movement one to movement two very quickly, as opposed to going all the way over to like a line leg curl machine. And then a long lever pelvic tuck plank for 25 seconds. So if this is a fat loss focused client, which the reality is is very much what that's geared towards. We know, okay, they're not going to burn that many calories with some type of intense finisher. They'd probably be better off just getting more, building more muscle, more strength. We also know, okay, they have a really relatively short amount of time to train. And we want to make sure there's all these boxes we've ticked, um, push, pull, knee, hip. But we also want to make sure they're getting plenty of core work in. We want to make sure they're getting some knee flexion in to keep their or, some knee flexion in, excuse me, to keep their knees healthy and build stronger hamstrings. So here, this is a good way, like AMRAPs, like I just explained there, are a good way to kill two birds with one stone. Because by the end of the circuit, the client is going to, their heart rate's going to be jacked up. They're going to have a good sweat going. They're going to feel like they just got somewhat of a cardio workout in. 
So in the client's mind, that often correlates to, okay, like this is really helping push my fat loss. The tempo's up. I feel good. My heart rate is jacked up. But also within that, they checked all these other boxes we need. Okay, we're helping improve their shoulder health here. We're getting their core stronger. We're keeping their knees safer, more stable. So as far as finishers go, that's really typically my thought process when programming these. And then because we are training all these variations, knee, hip, push, pull, at least three times a week, we don't want to just do the exact same variations every single time, but we need to be smart about how we're working in this exercise variation. So again, when we're looking at how this is laid out, basically day one, we have a hinge or a lower body posterior dominant movement. We have a followed by a superset of an upper body pull and a lower body anterior dominant movement. We have upper body push and we have a lower body anterior dominant movement. And then finally, we have our finisher. So when we're going into day two, we are starting with a horizontal press. Whereas day one, we started with a deadlift. Day two, we're starting with some type of press. Again, we're alternating lower body pull, upper body push. And then when we move on to our second movement of the day, which here, and I have these sample days laid out next to like these basic programming templates that I have to help you understand this more clearly. But then when we go into our second movement of the day, which again on day two is an upper body pull, whereas day one, we hit a dumbbell row, which is a horizontal pull. Day two, we want to switch that pattern up to be a vertical pull. So here we could train a chin up is a great example. Um, going into that next, so then like some other considerations for day two here, because if we did an upper body pull, then we know that we on our next movement generally to be some type of knee dominant pattern, right? Now, again, like I mentioned earlier, most clients that we work with, especially ones that are going to be following a full time or a three times a week full body split are going to be relatively newer to smart training. So we know they probably need more posterior work. So as opposed to making this, whereas typically this would be a more, again, like a knee dominant movement, I like to make this kind of a hybrid, which is what I would consider most like reverse lunge variations. We are going to hit glutes, hamstrings, and quads all at the same time, as opposed to making this like a squat pattern that's very um, knee dominant or quad dominant. So here we can plug in some type of dumbbell deficit reverse lunge is a great example of that. Then going into our next superset of day two, again, we have this upper lower superset. Now here we're back to our previous pattern. So here, for example, we plug in um, a TRX row and a dumbbell cyclist squat. Now first with our TRX row, you'll notice here we hit twice in a row. In both of these superset movements, we started a day with a horizontal press and then we hit two pulling movements for upper body in a row. That's because most clients, again, similar to what we just talked about with this lower body um, plugging in our deficit reverse lunge instead of a squat pattern, most clients, again, just need more volume for their upper back as opposed to our push muscles. Most clients already are going to be working at a desk all day or have in the gym just trained most of the muscles that they can see, which is going to be delts chest and neglect their upper back more. So it makes sense to generally program more upper back work. Again, though, we want these pulling movements to be ones that minimize stress on the spine. So as opposed to us having clients do like a barbell row here, a TRX row is a good option. And then finally, we have again, a dumbbell cyclist squat. So there we're finally taking off our final box here. Basically we hit um, push, pull, hip dominant. And now we have knee dominant with our cyclist squat and we got some extra volume for that pulling pattern. But again, our pulling patterns varied within days. Now, the cyclist squat and the TRX row superset, we also want to be smart there because again, here we're training two movements that hit this, both hit the backside of your body. So if I look at like different squat patterns that I could plug in here, let's say I had the client doing a TRX row and then going into a dumbbell or a goblet front rack squat where the client's holding or, um, kettlebells in excuse me, a kettlebell or we could, a goblet squat is a great example of this too, but where the client is holding something in the front rack or goblet position. So upper back comes into play a lot there, but upper back is also used a lot in this TRX row. So it's smart to choose. So the reality is like we had them go from the TRX row right to this like a uh, 
heavy loaded kettlebell front squat or goblet squat, then they would very likely, the upper back would become the limiting factor before our clients quads, glutes kill the movement. So the problem here is what we want to be the limiting factor, which is very much the client's lower body in a squat pattern, isn't the case. It's actually going to be their upper back. So here we want to program something again, like a cyclist squat or even like a lunge variation again would be good here. Really, you can't program, typically you can't, can't program too many unilateral or single leg movements for clients in a situation like this, where clients just want to improve functional strength. Most clients have spent a lot of time training bilaterally, so like barbell squat variations, leg press variations, but have done very little single leg work, which can lead some to some imbalances. And again, to just be functionally strong and fit, we need single leg work. Um, so the cyclist squat's a good choice there. And then finally, we have an arm finisher, which is every minute on the minute for six minutes. We're going to alternate dumbbell curls for 10 to 12 reps, followed by a dumbbell overhead extension. All right, so finally, just going to walk you through one more day here. We are hitting day three of this full body training program. And again, one more time, we want to hit knee, hip, push, pull, but we also want to alternate pattern. So day one, our metric-based movement was a deadlift. Day two, our metric-based movement was a horrible sonal press. So some type of bench press, floor press variation. Day three, we're going to hit some type of squat pattern. So here again, very much tailor this to your client's needs. Maybe it needs to be a Bulgarian split squat. Maybe it needs to be a front squat. Maybe it needs to be a hack squat. Don't just plug in barbell back squats all the time because the reality is for many clients, that just isn't the best fit. From there, then we're going to, going to go into again, this upper body push or upper body, lower body superset. Now we know because our first movement of the day, was a squat pattern, we want this superset to entail a hinge. So some type of Romanian deadlift is a good idea here typically. Big fan of Romanian deadlift for most clients, which means the other movement in our day needs to be some type of upper body push. Now here, because day one, we really focused on pressing overhead. Day two, we focus on pressing from a flat surface. Here, it makes sense for this to be some type of incline press. Basically, we're just hitting all three of those angles. And most clients, like, we could also make the argument that we could go vertical press day one, horizontal press day two, vertical press day three. But most clients, most gym pop clients are going to have trouble pressing overhead too much. And once we pass, like, eight hard sets per week, overhead pressing is as far as I typically like to push it. Most clients though, I typically like to just program one overhead press for three to five sets and not just an actual like a barbell wire press, but some different shoulder pressing variation and then hit the rest of their delts with lateral raises because most clients or lateral raise variations because most clients can work with these horizontal presses a lot more safely, a lot more pain-free than they can pressing overhead. Many people just don't have the prerequisite mobility to be able to press overhead and we can create a lot more shoulder issues. So it makes a lot more sense to focus more on horizontal pressing variations, even if it is from an incline. So here I have plugged in a one arm, dump, one arm dumbbell bench press. Again, this is gonna get some core involved and it's really just gonna feel like a more functional, fun movement for the client. And then we have that super set it with a Romanian deadlift. And then we're gonna go into, as always, another super set. So here we have a chest supported incline dumbbell row. Again, we've already done one movement that puts quite a bit of stress on the client's low back with a Romanian deadlift. So here, this row is, well, one, if we look at the movements that we ticked off this box so far, or boxes we ticked off so far, I don't know why I keep saying that wrong. We have a knee dominant, we have a push, we have a hinge, so we have to have some type of pull. Chest supported dumbbell row is smart because we've already put a lot of stress on the lower back with a dumbbell row mini deadlift, so we wouldn't want to do like a bar row bent over row variation again, or maybe even like a T-bar row variation, we probably want to avoid. Maybe we could do something with hand support. I am a fan of like a one-arm T-bar row where we have the other hand on the bench. But here I plugged in a chest supported inclined dumbbell row, and then we're pairing this with a hollow body sweep, which is just another core variation. And then finally, we are going into the finisher. Now, 
across the course of our last couple days of finishers. Day one, we added a lot of extra core work. We hit that knee flexion movement where we want to make sure we work into our week and some extra upper back work. Day two, we hit biceps, triceps, which everybody loves, just always smart from the ball. So day three, we're going to do something very metabolic that really jacks the client's heart rate up and really feels makes them feel like, damn, I am crushing this fat loss phase. This program is a great fit for me. Now, I'm not at all saying that like to like mislead your clients. And I always like to make it super clear, like, yo, the reality is what we're doing here isn't near as important for your fat loss as your diet. Your training program, the number one goal is to build as much lean muscle as possible. So as we get you leaner, you have more to show there. You'll look great as you get leaner instead of just looking skinny. But also things like this that are just fun for the client, challenging but fun, and again, feel like they've typically believed in the past that training needs to be to create the outcome that they want, is smart because it does increase buy-in. So here we have a metabolic finisher where we're just gonna have the client set a timer and complete this entire circuit as fast as possible with no rest. And this worked to be their previous time weekly. So here we have a bodyweight squat for 24 reps, a bodyweight reverse lunge for 12 reps, 24 reps of jump squat, and 12 jump lunges each side. Now that is absolutely brutal if you've never done it. If you're one of my clients, odds are you've probably done this before and you can vouch for how brutal this is. But taking it across the course of our three times a week full body training, that is, in a nutshell, that's essentially how we lay it out. So again, this is a split that I use a lot for beginner to intermediate clients, typically it's clients that haven't been following a smart style of programming for two years, but many clients that have been training for years and years, but they haven't been following smarter, well-structured methods like we provide within online coaching. This is the split that I'll start them with. And for clients that are super busy and just don't have a lot of time to train, this does work very well. Um, one last thing I'll also say, we have to understand that volume, frequency, and intensity very much work on a sliding scale. So as a couple of those factors move up, others have to move down and vice versa. So in this case, like I already mentioned, volume is usually pretty low across the course of a week here, just because we only are training three days a week. So we don't have a ton of room to apply volume to each muscle. So that means our frequency is relatively high because we're training everything three times a week. I wouldn't put that as like, I wouldn't say that's super high, but we do have a decent amount of frequency. This also means intensity can be a little bit higher. So whereas if this was like a five to six times a week training split, the reality is we'd probably spend a lot more time in like three RIRs, um, two RIRs. And then the last couple of weeks before we deloaded, we probably dropped down to like one RIR, um, zero one RIR. Here, it makes more sense to spend most of our time in one to two RIR. So one to two reps in reserve. Just because, again, our volume is so much lower that we need to push the intensity a little bit higher to get the results that our clients want out of this. All right. And as far as the full body split goes, that is all I have for you. Hopefully you found this helpful. If you would like to experience a training program from me personally created for you as an individual, just hit the link below to apply for coaching with me.